Hi all, I'm Vijay Jethani. So this is an exam preparation session. So far we have covered two sessions. Session one we covered developing Azure compute solutions, which was nothing but mainly on the past solution around container apps, container instances and app services. In second session we covered Azure Cosmos DB and Azure storage. Now in this session, we will mainly focus on implementing Azure security. So from exam point of view, first of all, let's see what we have as a part of exam requirements. A is mainly on how do we create an identity platform. Now once we say identity platform, this is an open source platform built by Microsoft for the enterprises. That means whatever the components we are going to talk here are open source. It is customized as per enterprises. So we will look into each of those components as we go through that particular agenda. Similarly, Microsoft Intra ID is nothing but the Azure Active Directory, which we have been working so far. So if you have been working in any sense in Azure, you are already having the users created their even the groups, security accounts and all those things as a part of Azure Active Directory. So Intra ID stands for Azure Active Directory. On top of that, we will also see how. Basically, we provision different types of accounts. How do we configure different apps to take care of authentication and authorization mechanism? Similarly, we are also going to see the shared access signature, which is nothing but a part of Azure storage. So we will take care of that and at last we will look at the Microsoft graph as well, because if you have been working in Microsoft 365 environment, I think Microsoft graph is an API through which we access these platforms. So first part covers basically user authentication and authorization and second part is more of a securing Azure solution. So in that basically we have. Three things mainly we will cover Azure Key Vault. We will cover app configuration store and then we will cover the manage identities. So that is pretty much the agenda for this particular session on implementing Azure security. Now let's get started. So first of all. Let's look at the identity platform itself and what components. We have in that. Now to start with. Let's start with the accounts itself or who will be the target audience. So at first place, if you see Microsoft Intra ID, that is nothing but your Azure Active Directory. So there are two things. One is your work account or it can be your academic account, which is nothing but the school accounts. So it follows pretty much everything we know so far. Personal Microsoft accounts are nothing but your Skype accounts, your live, your outlook.com accounts. Similarly, Azure B2C, if you have worked, this is a separate tenant ideally, which gets integrated mainly for a consumer facing apps. So once we talk about Azure AD B2C, there's basically a business to a consumer. So here you have a different authentication mechanism of what apps you are actually going to publish for B2C. So ideally your main tenant, which is on Azure Active Directory, is different from your actual B2C tenant. So remember these two things and Last is Microsoft Intra external ID. Now this is in preview at this point of time. So until it goes in production, we can't use it for the production scenarios, but to give you what exactly it will have is instead of having us just P2C, we are extending this platform the to include partners, even suppliers so that at the end of the day, there are no two separate tenants, one for your own internal tenant and one is an external tenant and then you set up the trust between them. 
so ideally what we are trying to say here is irrespective of who has or from which external tenant you are trying to access the internal tenant instead of making that so complex with the help of intra external id whether you have that tenant or not you will be able to authenticate to your resources using the tokens so that is pretty much you will see in this particular intra external id okay so this will be covering your customers your partners your service providers everything which is external to your internal tenant okay so ideally what we are trying to say here is instead of making separate b2c now it will be single tenant which will be taking care of your external id related from customers partners as well as the any particular customized identity solutions okay so this is bare, bare minimum of what accounts we will have now for us there are two things as we already saying first is authenticating to the system and getting authorized from the system right so authorization is more mainly on what are we allowed to access so first of all who part is basically who are you is basically your identity and then accessing the resources is where your access tokens are used so we have intra end points for the access as well as your id tokens so there are separate end points to which we have to request for authentication and authorization similarly if you are working in any particular developer environment you are using specific languages and framework there is a libraries already available for those particular languages including dotnet java python so these languages may have the authentication library so this basically helps you reuse already existing platform for conditional access caching of your authentication tokens similarly you can also have a single sign on with the help of this authentication library so these are the basic feature sets which you get out of box from this authentication library and as this is an identity platform and available over publicly we have a particular tenant which is intra.microsoft.com this is where actually you registered your apps okay so i will just pause here for a while so that you go through this particular identity platform okay to summarize i think it covers pretty much everything from what you were working through which is work and school personal microsoft account also you know pretty much which is nothing but outlook.com live.com and those particular accounts will be part of your microsoft personal accounts similarly b2c is the separate tenant as i said and now we are going with intra external id which will help us consolidate all the external ids whether they are customized whether they are customer whether they are partners into one particular external tenant then using the uh, different tenants for b2c okay so this is the work in progress it is not yet available for production but still in preview now moving on what we have as part of authentication and authorization standards so if you see at first place if you see oauth this is again an open authorization standard which is nothing but a framework for authorization for your web app your mobile your iot devices so what it does is basically it authorizes you as an individual as a person or as a service to access the resources which are hosted on web app mobile and iot devices but to help with the authentication we have open id connect as well which is built to work 
in connection with OAuth so that it provides an authentication layer and help you with the single sign on for your web apps as well as the mobile apps. So ideally what we are trying to say here is these are the open standard that means open ID connect for authentication and OAuth for authorization are used combinedly for authentication and authorization of resources you want to access. OK, now being the rest base, they use the JSON web tokens. So if you see the JSON web tokens, it transmits the JSON objects for authenticated users between identity providers and service requesting authentication. Now this will be for your mainly a REST based APIs or REST based services. There is also a SAML which works on REST as well as you on the SOAP services. So with this, basically there is an exchange of information using XML format. Here in mainly the REST APIs, you are using the JSON as the authentication tokens. But in SAML, you are having authentication and authorization using XML between your integrated solutions. Now this also is a part of your open standards which we use for authentication and authorization. And if you are already using some of the SOAP services, you SOAP and SAML, I think uh, having the old standard being used together. So you might have seen that in the practice also. The other thing is SCIM. Now this is nothing but the system cross domain identity management solution. Now basically it is used for a provisioning of users and groups. OK, so this this will help. This will speed up the process because it, it forms a schema. Now SIM, which we are saying here is 2.0, which has a schema for how do you create users and groups and accept it as an open standard. So that is the that is the reason we are sharing this so that what are the actual open standards which are used currently in both REST APIs as well as your SOAP APIs. OK, now coming to the last part, which is WS Fed. Again, this is Web Service Federation. I think you most of you might be using if you have used this before. It again is works very closely for your SOAP based installations or SOAP based identity management. APIs if you have worked through before. So this helps you basically provide you the uh, users to connect across the different security boundaries. When I say different security boundaries in a web, there is a cross domain access across irrespective of uh, which specific services you are using. So WS Fed uh, along with your trust and all complete WS security protocol stack you can think of and they work together to provide you a uh, so base API implementation which has a complete authentication authorization built in and uh, as I said uh, XML is the back end for them to exchange the information. OK, so again I will pause here for a while. So we covered OAuth along with open ID. Basically both helps each other from authentication and authorization. Similarly, the tokens they are using is JSON. And SAML is more of exchanging information of authentication and authorization in XML form. Uh, this is also widely adopted standard. And SIM is using for automated provisioning of user and group. And WSWeb is a web service federation. OK, so I will just pause here. So moving ahead, how do we actually check for identity and accessment related flow? So basically, if you see, we have an application. That means it is nothing but it can be a web browser. It is through the devices which you are trying to access some resource. It can be data. It can be something hosted publicly or available internal to as internal to your network as well. 
okay so application is application or client here is nothing but your web browser which is working or which is fetching information on your behalf that is the reason you see user as a resource owner it asks for authentication to identity server so here identity server in our case can be intranet id or it can be any external identity server which you are using for your ident authentication on authorization make as a platform okay so ideally first authentication goes here then then it asks as we discuss it ask for who you are because we have to actually impersonate you and give the access to an application or client so that it fetch information from a, a resource server that is where we send information about your to the client which in the form of id token and simultaneously we send the access token now based upon the access user may be having the access stone is access token is also given so id token along with access token is sent by client to a resource server from which we want to fetch the information or want to access the information so once that is authenticated and we are having access to a resource server we get a response from resource server so that we are able to access or i would say a client is able to access the information on your behalf okay so this is the complete flow of how identity and access management works so again i will pause here for a while okay so now let's see what are the terminologies we use within oauth and open id connect now here we are clearly calling out that we are using a microsoft identity platform and client is again here the you can consider this as a web browser and resource owner is nothing but you can consider this as an user at this point of time and bearer token is nothing but we will get some kind of the id as well as an access token to actually access the resource server where our data or information is kept okay so this process remains same only thing is we want to bring in the right terminology so if you see i have just clearly called out what are we trying to put here client device of web browser accessing web app web api or even the single page application authorization server is the identity platform resource server is hosting some kind of app and data for us resource owner is basically the your user or app who's having full access to that data bearer tokens are the exchange mechanism or i would say this is the way how you authenticate first for your own identity then getting an access based role based access based upon uh, what access you have on that resource server so this is all this is required along with the along with that id access uh, id tokens and access token it also has a refresh token because after point of time after some um, amount of time i think your tokens will get expire and you have to re ask for id and access tokens that is where the refresh tokens are also mentioned here okay so these are the bearer tokens which you will use in this open id connect and oauth 2 identity platform now before even we get that that means for the id token as well as access token what work we need to do before hand is we want to register our app in the identity platform so that client who will get an access on behalf of us understand that this yes this app exist and it can do the handshake yes this is a client id uh, i am supposed to access uh, for the and uh, use for accessing the resource server so that is where app registrations is a way for client to trust 
the identity platform okay and endpoints as i said that as this is a whole api based identity platform we have already exposed the identity or i would say an authorization endpoints similarly the token endpoints which are nothing but giving us an access token for accessing appropriate resources okay so so far we just covered how the identity platform looks like what are the different components different accounts endpoints and uh, authentication library what are the open authorization and authentication standards and uh, versus i think we clearly called out rest versus soap as an implementation strategy and the format as json for mostly the rest space and soap uh, being heavily on the uh, ws trust or ws stack protocol which is which also has ws fed okay so this these are the pretty much we called out till now and we gone through how the particular flow how the user authenticates how they get an access um, based upon uh, the mechanism we have in place and finally we just covered a sample of oauth and open id and what are the terminologies being used for accessing the information or data now let's look more into how this access will look like or i would distinguish purely between the user versus a daemon or uh, i would say something which is being programmed to do work on our behalf okay so in when you see delegated access you have a user permission applied to app or client which is allowed or given access on your behalf to access data at a specific resource but in case of app only access it is nothing but the app only or i would say a secure service account or daemon account being given access on your behalf to do some kind of work now example in both the cases is when you are logging on to a specific website which requires an authentication the client that means a browser through which you are accessing your data or particular app is actually getting a permission on your behalf and you are able to see the data on that screen or web browser but in case of app only access it is more of a, a back end process uh, maybe something getting installed uh, and does not require a browser or something of that sort a simple example we can give here is once we use any particular um, uh, devops right so we do some installation using pipelines we do some implementations automatic automated implementations there we use a service accounts similarly some kind of script we want to run on behalf of uh, uh, using some service account and try to do some installation on the uh, platform or cloud okay so in that case app only permissions are required we don't need a user uh, permissions being delegated to the app here purely we create a service accounts so in that case it's clearly called out that wherever you see app specific permissions you can consider this as a service account or the daemon accounts which are the background processes kind of for example you can take okay now let's look at how this varies on which type of applications uses that so if you see delegated permissions mainly a web mobile and single page app where the user is working through a device or client maybe a web browser who has to fetch data on your behalf will use this as i said similarly there can be a web domain some background work which does not require a interactive uh, interaction between you you can consider that as a daemon so access context behalf of user this gets without user okay who can constant user can constant for the data admins can constant now based upon the data which is available we may have a user constant and the admin constant 
now a simple example is you are filling your own time sheets okay so you will require the user consent because you are trying to fill your time sheet but however a admin who wants to fetch the time sheets for all employees he will require some kind of administrator access so that he can fetch all from the relevant identity platform so that is where the admin constant will come into picture or maybe uh, wherever he is fetching a report interactively however he can also do the uh, using daemon or maybe some script in that case uh, the only admin can consent because here there is no user involved okay so that is the difference you are able to see here so it is clearly called out that from a constant method specific whenever we have a delegated permissions when user is active you will see the static dynamic permissions are appearing but in case of application or the daemon related uh, apps you will only see static because this is we pre configure it before it can't happen at a live that someone is already sitting there and you change the permissions at the runtime and all that can happen that is we have already configured a service account which will do do n number of 1 2 3 4 kind of a jobs for us okay so you clearly called out so that is the reason it is clearly said static only that means it already knows what kind of the work we already know before we have already planned for that that is the reason it has to be only static but in case of a uh, in case of a user uh, the permission or the, the the access grant and everything can happen at run time that means only for that particular point of time so this is that is the reason it is being dynamic we can't keep this as static uh, because of security related issues okay so here again the scopes will obviously come into picture because depending upon the uh, we clearly called about uh whether it is in contributor role or it will the admin role or read read only view only role but in case of apps i think it has to be the app related permission that what specific uh, they are very much uh, limited to what a user can do so that is the reason you see a limited roles in case of app role assignment versus what a user authentication and scope permission will look like okay so this is the bare basic of how the delegated access versus app only access works okay so now till here we covered pretty much everything on user authentication and authorization now we are coming to assured access signature types now uh, why we require these at first place now a uh, example you can take is there are some contractors who will be doing some work so instead of creating their accounts and creating a role based access for role based access control for them what we're trying to do here is we are giving them a shared access uh, uh, which is purely on this purely works on the storage accounts nothing uh, more services are being used here so this is only for the storage point of view doing some uploads and something on that that part so with this shared access signature uh, we are trying to create uh first of all a time based access for them and the time based access will work on account level that means uh, when i say accounts as is it that has nothing but your storage account level uh, which has your uh, kind of a blob queue table as well as your azure files so so you have a storage account within that you have these four services so service as is again just to give access on that simple uh, blob table queue or the azure files so that is a service saas but why do we need a user uh, related saas now this is mainly required when we want to give an access or i would say a role based access control which is tied to your azure active directory account okay so this is where you will use a service account and you will give an access to a specific service uh, using a role based access in others service and account it is purely read write versus modify and all those things but in user delegation saas so it's it can have a role based access control the way you have like a contributor role the owner uh, and also the read only and the view only roles everything will come into here uh, once you have a user delegation now what's what is the best practices obviously https we use and uh, the most secure saas is user delegation because we are clearly calling out not giving access to a whole account not giving access to whole service as a whole we are only giving a role based access which is a minimum 
privilege to a specific resource within that okay it can be a simple blob it can be a, 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 a folder or something of that sort using that particular so that is where the difference between a service account and the user delegation is more uh, distinguished here also you can set an expiration time to a smallest while you create these particular access signatures and obviously you have to apply minimum privileges and uh, SAS isn't always the correct solution. That's correct because ideally this is only for the users for which we cannot create the accounts or we we don't want to have the uh, the management overhead of actually having them in the system. That is where you will use SAS and that too uh, re relevant to your storage accounts itself. Nothing more than that. Okay. Coming to the uh, last part, which is on graph APIs. I think, as I said, Microsoft 365 is a SaaS platform, a collaboration platform, you can say, for uh, the uh, mails or different particular conversations or collaborations you're having around. Similarly, your Windows machines, that is Windows 10, uh, and along with enterprise mobility and security. So these are mostly a SaaS platform where you don't have much role to create actual anything within that or to do any configurations within that. So for that, I think we have been given access to Microsoft Graph API through which we can fetch a relevant information, enhance that experience which suits our needs based upon what we want to have out of it. We can have a, a automated bots. We can have a web app or some some application or a web browser showing some stats around that. So anything and everything around what we want to make most out of that platform, which is nothing but M365, we can enhance with the help of APIs or the functionality being exposed and build the build the functionality or web app or bots after that to build our experience. The other thing which you see at the bottom here is Apart from this, they are connectors. That means outside world to connect with an outside world and to bring the data. We can have the connectors which bring the data from external world and bring it to uh, using the graph APIs and then actually fetch using the connectors and fetch here uh, to enhance this platform. Similarly, we can also connect to the uh, graph data connect connect which is nothing but it connects your Azure data stores for you can run the data warehousing or even analytics to bring uh, the value out of data. You can create the Power BI dashboards and a number of things. So what we are trying to say here is the platform. Which is which was a SaaS being exposed using graph so that you can enhance as well as extend that experience not limited to whatever is being provided by a first party, but you can build your own apps around that to bring or to build upon the experience around M365. OK, so this is what is being meant by graph APIs. So that pretty much covers what we have as a part of user authentication and authorization. OK, so if you see authentication authorization using identity platform and authentic authorizing Microsoft intra ID, which is nothing but open ID, which we talked about along with the OAuth and uh, implementing shared access signature and implementing solutions using graph. So this was bare minimum. You should know from a theoretical per se. However, if you really want to do the hands on labs, I have also called out the hands on lab. I'm just bringing to that so that you get end to end knowledge of how actually one particular. So this is a lab for AZ204 itself, which which clearly works out step by step in a lab environment. So obviously you have to create a one virtual machine uh, in the cloud for that and have this uh, lab running through that so that or maybe if uh, basic will be to follow step by step what is written here. But I think if you want to deviate also, I think you have to have uh, at least CLI installed on your machine 
to have this uh, lab completed. But I would suggest if you are new to the Azure, but better go by a step by step uh, lab. OK, so in this lab, basically what they're trying to do here is this is an architecture diagram which they are trying to implement. So. First of all, as you see at 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 overall is a tenant. OK, so there is a default directory within that tenant and you are trying to actually impersonate this particular user one. Trying to access. OK. Resources. OK, so OIDC uh, authenticate to the uh, the app registration. OK, so basically whatever I talked about that that means if you see uh, you will actually register your app in the identity platform so that the client trust you that you are exactly the same once you get the ID token that is a similarly is an access token for the resource which you have to access so in this particular lab i think they have covered pretty much everything how you actually create that step by step and then you actually registered the app give some name and in here they are connected a single tenant so you can use that as also they are given the screenshots so that if even if you want to deviate and have uh, explority around explore around whatever different options you can go through okay so just go through this particular step by step how you are actually trying to create this particular identity platform along with the registration of your apps. OK, so they are they are giving you step by step configurations which you have to do. Now there are something uh, which you will obviously follow during that lab is like implicit grant is basically given the way you access right so if you have been the uh, the way the owner has the implicit access similar is implicit access grants work if you have been given access to a resource group or subscription level so that is what they will they are calling here but but as we are talking clearly about the app getting uh, access based upon the user so you have to follow that as a uh, base and then accordingly relate to whatever we are being giving access to OK. So you clearly see. The end points which we talked through and whatever the flow we have looked through. How do you create? As I said, you can go through actually the CLI as well if you are working on your own laptop, but I think it is better always to um, create a machine uh, or something uh, which you can authenticate or you can access the environment from easily within Azure. But I agree both the options will work for you if you are already aware of that and are working on Azure platform or Azure CLI from your machine. OK, so just follow step by step and you are creating a web app here because at the end of the day what we are trying to do here is this a web app is actually we are trying to uh, authenticate or get access to using this OIDC uh, connect. OK, so they have given you the pretty much everything from this lab and what exactly files you will create and how do we actually run this through each and every program as such from a developer per se. And finally, you test this particular scenario. So in short, if you see they have clearly called out. What exactly you need at first place, OK? Before you start and then you go through step by step. So that was all about this particular lab. There are also a lot of uh, the documentation which you can get on the Microsoft website as well for this particular identity platform. Just search around and play around with that. Uh, see from exam point of view, I think you will not get any labs as such. But for you to have experience, I would suggest you go through any particular uh, step by step or how to do guides for this identity platform that will make you uh, actually proficient on those particular technologies which we have talked about just now. OK, so with this, I think we end the first part, which was authentication and authorization. Now from here onwards, I think we will deep dive into the second part, which is nothing but implementing 
secure Azure solutions. OK, so as I've already talked about from the. Agenda aspects, we are going to cover Key Vault. Then we will cover the manage identities and then last we will end on app configuration store. So why do we need Key Vault at first place? So if you have been using Key Vault, I think we pretty much use for keeping our secrets, also keeping our keys, which are nothing but key value pairs and a certificates as well. So this is a bare minimum what you can have as a part of a key vault and then the advantages we get from a vault is basically we are keeping everything at the central places so that it can be fetched when it is required by a program or we can fetch this using programmatically and also have a mechanism of life cycle management of those keys. You have a logging monitor activity and to simplify administration. Now this is what we are clearly calling out why we need key vault and how do we authenticate to it or what are the mechanisms we have now whatever we talked about from a user authentication and authorization per se you will use exactly either a daemon or you can use a service account or you will use a user account the way you are actually accessing your key vault if it is a interactive obviously you will a user account if it is a daemon or something obviously you will use a service principle so those are bare minimum and there is manage identity is something which is being created for while you where you want a uh, azure or microsoft to take care of whole password and i would say identity management for that particular account is where the managed identities are being used for so it can work with your uh, services. There are some of the past services. Sim similarly, is for your virtual machine. You can have a managed identity uh, taking care of your identities. OK, so you can have a managed identity which is end to end taken care by uh, the platform. You only use them for an access or I would say connecting within the services. Between the services service principle and certificate again this is nothing but an object service principle is nothing but an object in your own tenant which has a certificate uh, which has an associated certificate uh, which which identifies you as i said who you are kind of identifies this particular principle for what purpose it's being used and accordingly be given access to the key vault service principle and secret again this is more of a, a uh, the identity and the password which you have stored uh, so these are the three ways to authenticate the key vault. Now, based upon learning so far, the key vault which we are talking here was ideally for uh, you can keep the passwords, a key management keys, key value pairs, even certificates in the software key vault only. When once it comes to the HSM which is an hardware based security model there. I think the terminology changes to keeping only keys. OK, so they may you may be calling them as a secrets or something, but I think the terminology uh, the way it is being defined here. It's clearly that whatever you've been calling for certificates, whatever you've been calling for a secrets, whatever you've been calling for keys here only you will you will have keys defined or key value pairs in a vault. Also, the other distinguishing factor is if you see. Key vault. From a software per se is a software external to the your actual storage of uh, the secrets that is vault. OK, so there are the algorithms which actually uh, does the conversion or hashing before you can store them in the key vault. Whereas in hardware based security model, it is purely the. You can say a cryptographic processor built in within the hardware or you can say a specialized hardware with the software only for purpose of storing so that keys are not exposed externally. So that is the difference between your software and the hardware related vaults. 
okay so that is where we are saying clearly calling out the different vault solutions you have so if you are using them uh, hsm protected with the premium i think this is still to extend uh, a kind of a shared hsm but while you use the managed ssm it is more uh, using the the hardware base uh, the vault okay so just remember depending upon the service you choose you either choose a software service or you choose a hardware based services okay now based upon that there are different algorithms uh, or different uh, i would say a cryptographic uh, naming conventions you have rsa supported uh, basically software protected rsa key uh, what kind of the uh, uh, encryption length or you, you can say the uh, bits being used as a vaults okay so this is this is the standard similarly is for elliptical curve key which is again uh, the hashing algorithm type even though the key uh, length is small but they are uh, more efficient than any rsa based keys so i think we need not go much detail into this but i think you should just know that there are Uh, different hashing algorithms or i would say cryptographic algorithms uh, for having this keys stored in the vault before the keys are stored in the vault similarly for hsm these are the algorithms and the supported keys you need not remember all of them but this is just for info that uh, the bit the bits being used that means the key size uh, is small in case of elliptical curve than the others and is efficient as well so just you should know which is better than other okay so now uh, as i already 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 told you like based upon the object type keys are supported in the vaults but if you see secret certificates and storage account keys that means cert- these are not supported in actual ssm pools these are only supported in your software vaults so remember that whatever we are being talking through keys secret certificates they are only applicable for your software key vaults not for hsms or hardware security modules so just going through the key vault best practices we have to use a separate key vaults per environment so that is a recommended so that we don't mess up with the similar kind of keys and also a role based access control uh, based on the environments will vary and uh, and sensitively vary whether that is a development environment versus a production environment obviously there has to be uh, specific control based upon which environment or there may be different policies to be applied i would say in, in another case Uh, to control uh, in a effective manner similarly backup logging recovery option so that if you want if any key is particular deleted what is a purge option you should have for that to get recovered in a production environment or even guarding against of deletion of those secrets by a uh, admins so these are the uh, key vault best practices you can go through okay so now coming to the manage identities now as we have been talking what exactly are the manage identities first of all the manage identity is something which is being managed uh, fully based upon whether that is a system versus user now how that is different if you see the system assign is mainly a works with virtual machine or app services and the azure has full control of that that means it stays with the resources throughout the life cycle that means from the start of creation of the resources that exist and it 
stays till that resource until that resource is deleted okay so that means complete life cycle it remains and that is a system assigned or you can say from a scope per se but in case of user you create it first and then you assign that to a specific resource because it is a user assigned so we have to create that first before we can give them any access to that identity okay so that is the difference between system versus a user assign manage identity even though the passwords and everything will be rotated internally with that but still the access mechanism or the deletion of that is with us that is the reason if you see the life cycle it comes with the resource and gets deleted along with the resource however it has a, however if you see in user assign it is an independent life cycle that must be explicitly deleted because we created it first before even giving access to that okay Sh sharing across azure resource now as this is create created for that particular purpose that means it will stay for that purpose and gets deleted that is the reason it is only staying for that particular resource for what that is created because we that does not have any information about any other uh, ex resources coexist but in case of a user assign manage identity we create it and we assign it so that is the reason i think it it can be assigned to more than one azure resource so just remember these things and now from an exam point of view they ask you just the terminologies around this and as i said if you are well aware of some of the clis how you create those uh, respective key vaults or manage identities and that is pretty much enough for this module for you to cover in the exam okay so this is pretty much uh, you want to know from an exam point of view but whatever we have covered so far uh, if you even uh, go through the documentation as well as whatever we have been going through i think you will have pretty much everything to cover for this exam from a security standpoint now coming to the last part which is an app configuration store here first of all why we need this now today we are actually building the apps which are stateless that means we really want to separate the configuration from actual coding or the binaries of that implementation of the services that is where we need this configuration store at first place okay and as this is an app configuration store and cloud based services it is a fully managed managed services it gives you complete functionality to do a key value pairs similarly it also gives you a facility to mark a feature or toggle a feature on off that means during the life cycle of your app you may be doing n number of changes version 1 version 2 version 3 of those particular apps so you do you do have need to have a mechanism where you can turn off those feature sets that is where we call this a feature flag uh, management is being provided to you so based upon that there will be a uh, changes done in an app settings dot json which is nothing but uh, you can say a declarative way of saying what needs to be pulled into based upon which features i have made it on okay so app configuration store is nothing but a key value store which takes care of all the configurations which you were previously have to do manually in the system or or even during programmatically you might be putting some information uh, can be your environment based can be your can be uh, the respective values you have to put for respective connection strings or something of that sort as well for connecting to the apis okay so basically if you see here tagging the labels point in time replay of settings dedicated ui feature then enhance security through manage identities also available uh, data encryption at rest and transit native integration so obviously it gives you a workable option of a configuration for any particular language or framework it is a centralized management and distribution of your configuration store okay configuration data for your apps now this can be your containers this can be your kubernetes environment this can be your app services mainly i would say 
where you are trying to build a stateless and the configuration being loaded at the runtime kind of the environment because making the changes and tracking those changes is difficult than actually making your environment stateless because that works seamlessly say suppose if you want to replace something which configurations are fixed so you can really bring out that from an app store then actually configuring them for every environment right from your development to the production okay now key values now as this is more of a key value here they have just given you how actually you create the namespace okay so there are two approaches that means you have a flat structure that is you define key value pair a specific set for that particular environment and you repeat it across in a flat manner that means you use the environment so and the whatever the data paths whatever you are using that is a flat key structure but in hierarchical it may be something like say suppose you are creating one app and it has say module 1 module 2 module 3 or service 1 service 2 service 3 service 4 so in that case it becomes an hierarchical model so <coughs> structure in which you define the keys will define whether you are using a flat structure versus the uh, hierarchical structure okay so while you i think we have an a uh, lab for this as well so just understand the terminology here and then you can while you actually create this on your own you will get a hands on to what we are talking through this particular session okay now this is a, a sample cli how do you actually create this configuration store okay so this is basically uh, if you see this these are just the parameters we are defining and then on cli which we are just calling out a, a respective uh, app config store creation okay so this is basically taking these parameters what we are defined and then having their respective uh, key value pairs that is here i am doing a connection string uh, um, setup for and just just echoing that connection string that whether that is set up in that particular so this is just a simple example but idea was to give you uh, that remember the clis for everything and everything in especially the developer exams i think they are very much specific focused on the clis then actually the portal based installation so remember if as much you know about the cli i think it will be easy to crack that particular exam now feature management i, I already talked about little about that but this is something to as i said you are having the base and you want to really segregate a feature or module by module or whatever you are building uh, uh, from a release per se and you want to keep it in a separate repository or some kind of feature branch kind of that okay and based upon the feature flag set on or off you can actually uh, have those config build into the runtime only when the feature flag is on and you can keep it off if you don't want to bring that config available for that particular application so that is the ease you are getting at a runtime using this feature flag okay also you can have filters for evaluating the state that means if if this is yes then obviously a corresponding uh, setting should be on or off you can also control in that way so it is a iterative approach you can follow that obviously if app is on then obviously the service one if you have hierarchical structure then service one should but if the app itself or maybe the feature flag for that uh, is off then obviously the services or the settings configuration below that should not be available so so that i think you can control with the help of the filters a separate repository so here is a what they saying component that implement effective feature management an application that make use of an feature flag first of all then separate repository that stores the feature flags and their current states so it is a repository the way i said the feature branches corresponding to the feature flags and then getting pulled at a respective is what you can set in form of a key value pair okay so and the feature manager supports app settings or json as a config source as well that means you can also code them and uh, on off in the configuration file okay now below is just to give you uh, how actually uh, you have to use this effectively and uh, how you use a feature flag you need to externalize all feature flags used in application 
so as you obviously as we are separating this out so we want a more flexible way of working with the configurations is what we're trying to say here is now also going further they are clearly calling out how do you encrypt the configuration data using your own keys that is customer managed keys you create an instance and you have a key vault taking care of the where your keys are stored and then finally applying those hashing algorithms uh, then you obviously keep are keeping them uh, secure uh, from and you all always pull out the relevant details okay from key value uh, so that is what i think we are using key vault so that whatever we see the sensitive data is there we can keep them in the vault then actually keeping them in a, a storage okay so that is what they are saying providing an option here bring your own key similarly allow azure application configuration use key vault keys that means first one was you have your bring your own keys and configure them another one one was you you create a manage identity itself to manage uh, everything for you okay so that also we can have that and finally you can also create a private endpoints for but i think rather than giving you a heavy dose and going going point by point i would say at end i think there are a specific labs here so if you see we have labs for uh how do you actually implement the configuration store and the key vault okay so for app service i will just uh, show you all of them so this is for app service and azure functions so basically how do you create the store i think you have to follow this quick start guides create a manage identity and then from there onwards i think you actually whatever i've shown you from the uh, we just the way you see the connection string you also see the other parameters uh, how you actually fetch those ids and then you assign those identities or giving access to those identities what they have referred here and then you plug the actual key value pairs in a key vault provide them access policy so these are all the all uh, relevant stuff i think um, you have to go through for this step by step lab but it, this pretty much will help you to understand how actually we are taking care of the complete implementation of the app store okay and uh, and this is being used for app service or azure functions okay so you can use for both them similarly they have given uh, for kubernetes as well how this looks like for a kubernetes as a service again prerequisites you create a store you create a obviously we need to have some services before we get started and then we use a key value pairs either using a key vault or even we want to store something in that a store in a form of key value pair that remains in that pass services which is a app configuration store for us okay so pretty much everything as i said everything here will be cli and some configuration files which we have to play around and complete these labs okay so uh, coming to the last part i think again container apps also will be equivalently equally uh, on the same prerequisites that you create a store you create a key vault and then apply the configs around that put a key value pairs and then that is how the configurations are separate from your actual implementations binaries so basically everything going on the clis and you have a step by step configurations with you so so these are pretty much available uh, in in the i will leave the links with you for uh, after the end of this session so that you can actually go through these labs on your own as well okay so that's all for this session just to summarize what we have covered so far is there were two sections one was on implementing user authentication and authorization which was mainly to know the identity platform and how these terminologies or i would say understand these terminologies around how do you authenticate how how the application or the client knows you with the help of id token and then finally give you an access using access token to that resource server okay this is the for first part and then we also seen some of the shared access signature which is used for azure storage graph is mainly for your microsoft 360 platform 365 platform uh, which 
is nothing but a SaaS platform. It gives you an opportunity to uh, enhance the experience as well as take the data out of it for exploratory or maybe for dashboarding and even uh, building uh, analytics or run some analytics on top of that data. Okay, so that is where the graph uh, solutions will come into picture. Second part, I think we covered pretty much everything around a key vault, why the key vault is required, then key vault versus the HSM, that is hardware security module. Difference is basically the, the cryptography algorithms stays for HSM, they stays within the hardware. The keys don't leave the hardware. They are within the hardware. Hence, it is safe and no one is able to tamper with those particular security keys. Whereas in case of Key Vault, we use the hashing algorithms and hash them before we store in the secrets in the Key Vault. So the Key Vault, software Key Vault, which you're talking about is more of a, a store than actually the having any cryptography built into. OK, so that remember what we are trying to do in software key vault is just trying to fetch. It is just a placeholder for those keys to be secured. It is not having any intelligence within that. But whereas in hardware security model, you have a cryptographic processors as well as the software around that specially built to have a secure vault. Which cannot be tampered. OK. And then we look into the then our next part, we look into manage identities. We go on to system which is fully managed by system and it is attached to the resource with which it is created. In case of a user uh, manage identities, it was purely the. We create those identities, even though the, uh, the those identities are managed, uh, the passwords are managed, but I think what we are what we are trying to say here is the won't be deleted automatically because it we are we have created that hence it is not tied to the life cycle of resource for which it can be assigned to n number of resources it is not just for a single resource okay so manage identities we covered there and finally we gone through a app configuration store app configuration store is nothing but just separating the configuration settings which you have as a part of your app services, your Azure functions, even the containers. What we're trying to do with the app configuration store is separate the configurations from your code binaries. That means service provisioning should be stateless and then configuration should be based upon the feature flag set. I want to bring a right configurations for a specific environment at a runtime that saves uh, efforts also it is a secure way that means it is it will not be tampered uh, while it is being being used in any particular environment on the cloud so that's all we have for this session thanks for listening